All right, we are live, everyone. Welcome to uh, Fishers in Initiative for Project 100. We want to thank everyone for being here. Um, before we get started, we want to start off with a brief video and then get straight into our program. I 
Thank you so much for that beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song, Satoya. I want to welcome everybody um, to our current national discussion discussing the past, the present, and the future of politics within our Black communities. I want to thank every single one of you guys for being here. I first off want to give all glory to God, um, all honor to God, um, greet our Board of Bishops, the President of the Board of Bishops, our presiding prelate, uh, Bishop. Crenshaw. I want to thank our missionary supervisor for all her initiatives. And I also want to thank the entire AME Zion Church for putting on this amazing initiative to involve and engage our communities in voting. We want to start off and we're going to hop right into one of our first topics that is going to discuss the history of our vote. Uh, we know that our community um, is underrepresented. Uh, we want change. We want things to change, but we have to know where we came from to know where we're going. Um, our first topic is going to be delivered by no one other than Marcus Farrell. Um, I would give him an introduction, but I would do him no justice. So I will go ahead and let him introduce himself and hop right into our first topic, which is the history of our Black folk. Marcus, take it away. Thank you, uh Thank you, Joy. I appreciate it. Appreciate everyone who uh, is joining us, who's watching us right now. And big shout out to Satoyo for that amazing rendition of the Negro National Anthem. That's uh, every time I hear it, I get chills. Uh, my name is Marcus Farrell. I am uh, the former African American Outreach, National African American Outreach Director for Bernie Sanders in 2016. Uh, I was uh, Stacey Abrams' Deputy Campaign Manager uh, down here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I've, I've gotten the first help get the first black mayor of Jacksonville, Florida elected. Um, and if you know anything about Jacksonville, Florida, you know that a black man is not necessarily the, a, a person that should be elected. But uh, when we vote, we uh, we succeed. Uh, also, uh, my most recent job was the um, uh, ch chief of staff of the New Georgia Project. We are we are the America's largest African American led voter registration organization. And during my tenure there, we, we registered over 465,000 people. And the biggest thing about that work is not just registering people, but making sure that their right to vote is still protected. So we did a lot of work around just making sure that once uh, someone was eligible to vote and registered to vote, that they could then uh, parlay that uh, their American uh, their American civic duty and to being able to to have a vote have their vote be counted and uh, i hope in this discussion that we can actually get into that because not only registering to vote is important but historically as i'll go into very soon uh just being able to protect the vote especially in uh, urban communities and southern communities and black communities uh they you know america doesn't necessarily want us to vote so i'll go i'll get right into it uh so in 1865 uh, we all should know this, but if you don't know, in 1865, the 13th Amendment was passed that officially ended the enslavement of 
African Americans and black people in this country. Now we all know that in paper, that's in, that's in theory, because we still have a criminal justice system that does us wrong. So we really never left slavery as our dear sister Ava DuVernay has, uh, has told us and has taught us. Uh, but in 1865, that's when we were officially free. Uh, the 14th and 15th amendments technically allowed us to vote and those were passed in um, 1866 and 18, through 1866, basically through 1870 is when, um, is when African-American men, you know, we need to make sure that we get this out, African-American men were allowed to vote for the first time. Women weren't allowed to vote until 1920 during the suffrage movement. That means black women were double oppressed once again um, and so we need to keep that in context when it comes down to the amazing turnout that black women have today in today's voting elections. You guys are, def black women are definitely saving society when it comes down to being eligible and registered to vote and actually swinging elections in favor of policies that will affect African Americans. I want to point out that from 1865 basically to 1875, once uh, Reconstruction was ended, they basically gave us 13. 15 to 17 years of being able to vote uh, and what happened during Reconstruction. Uh, once Reconstruction ended, Southern states across the nation with the highest population of African Americans uh, decided to start making statewide restrictive, uh, very restrictive policies, keeping us from being able to vote. And even when we did, we were allowed the right to vote. They would do voter intimidation tactics. The Ku Klux Klan went out of their way to make sure that African Americans in the South and across the nation, uh, if you even fathom to say the word vote in those times, uh, you can get killed. So here's the thing, registering to vote, not even voting, but registering to vote uh, in the early 1700s, all the way basically to the 1965 Voting Rights Act was passed even just extending yourself to register to vote was almost a death sentence. Uh, and here's some interesting facts and here's some interesting numbers. Before the 1965 Voting Rights Act, only 20% of registered African Americans turned up and showed up to vote. That's how strong voter intimidation was. And when certain people say make America great again, those are the those are the places where they're actually trying to they're trying to take us back to that place where uh, they can make America great by making sure that we're intimidated to go do our American uh, civil duty and vote. So you, you have to remember in, in context that when people it's not a cliche, when people say uh, people have died for your right to vote, not only did they die for your right to vote, they died for your right to get registered. Uh, and that's a very big, I want everyone on this call to understand who's watching this to understand that the process of even registering to vote. So when you see a young person, whatever color, whatever connotation, when you see a person say, are you registered to vote? That person, if they had that same job in 1919, then they would be risking their lives. Right. So take these people serious who are out here trying to get registered to vote. And if you if you can, you know, this is an action question, then you need to if you're reg go register to vote. And if you can try to actually get people registered your vote uh, to vote yourself. I want to bring it back to more current times um, in 26 in, tw in 2008 was the highest turnout of African-Americans in the history of American vote for uh, President Barack Obama. Uh, in that election, 66% of African Americans voted that were eligible to vote, 66%. Therefore, uh, there was a blowout and uh, the first black president of America got elected. So when we show up, we really do show out. Uh, consistently, when it comes down to the vote, black women across the nation vote at a percentage of somewhere in between 80 to 92 percent in statewide elections in comparison to black men. And this is a fallacy. I want everyone to understand this. This is a fallacy that people think that black men don't vote, but black men vote a lot. We are the second highest voting group uh, when it comes down to supporting the Democratic Party. Uh, and when it comes down to actually voting in statewide elections, we average anywhere from uh, 70 to, to 85 percent of, of voting in statewide elections. Why does this matter? Well, we have to vote. And the reason why is because the current tactics that were taken from the 1860s and the early, 18, uh, early 1900s of suppressing the vote has taken a different face has taken a different zone, has taken a different magnitude. In the state of Georgia, here in the state of Georgia, uh, during the election between Brian Kemp and Stacey Abrams, over 400,000 voters were purged from the rolls 
90% of them being African-American voters. Over 400,000 voters during the period of an election cycle. It didn't help that Brian Kemp also was the Secretary of State, meaning that he was not only playing the referee, but he was in the game. So when you, so when you see African Americans talk about our, regist our registration and, and how we protect the vote, when it comes down to the history and the connotation of it, uh, black people, in my opinion, we not only have to show up, but we have to blow out the elections. And the reason why we have to blow out the elections because we don't want to give the people who don't want us to vote any reason to try to take away our numbers. So if you vote and your vote is not counted, then make, your, make sure your cousins are registered to vote also. So I'll bring it back to currently in America. Right now we are seeing in the past three days, we have seen the highest early voting turnouts in the history of America. Somewhere, somewhere in between 30% of black voters have already read, have already put in their numbers when it comes down and put in their votes when it comes down to early voting numbers. So again, I want to just for the history connotation of this conversation, I wanted to make it be known that early voting, voting early is everything that we can do because they're going to do everything in their power until we exercise our vote down ballot all the way to president. And this is very important down ballot to president. We need to be just as exciting, excited for the dog catcher race as we are for the presidential race. Not only do they affect our lives more down ballot, but it increases turnout for the big race that we all are paying attention to, right? So support support your Ossoff, support the pastor here, Pastor Warnock, support Jamie Harrison, support uh, the Democrats across the board when it comes down to the, because at least we can have conversations with the Democratic Party and we can't necessarily have it with the Republican Party. Last thing I want to say, Joy, is just make sure that you know that we need a blowout. We don't need just a slim margin. If you look at if you look at what's going on today in the in the in the Senate, uh, we are about to confirm a justice that will definitely set us back to 1920 when it comes down to being able to have the right to vote. And if we don't blow it out, we're gonna they're gonna take this election from us. So no excuses. In 19 in, in 2008, we had 66% of black voters. This time around, I'd like to see 90%. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. You have me fired up. That's some history that you gave us there. Um, some real stats, some real facts. And you know, one thing that I would just wanna wanna piggyback off is that people died for us to be able to vote. Right. And I think that sometimes for sure, when we go to current times and we look at, you know, the, 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 the stage and the states we're in right now, um, people don't want to register to vote or they don't want anything to do with politics. But we don't know that this was like the lifeblood of our black community. This is what we did. You didn't have a choice whether you want to get involved. You had to get involved because your livelihood depended on it. Um, and people died for us to matter. So thank you so much, Marcus, for touching on that. Um, next, we wanna go and we wanna start and kind of shift into how our black community was involved. Uh, in particular, when we were um, talking about the Civil Rights Act and we were talking about very, very big fundamental stages in US history, for sure, um, black history, we want to look at the church. So right now we're going to have Reverend Dr. Staccato K. Powell II touch on um, the church involvement in politics, the history of it, and why it's so important that we get involved again. Take it away. Amen. Let me first of all uh, greet you all in the match of this marvelous, miraculous name of Jesus the Christ. I appreciate Brother Pharrell's insight um, regarding this matter. Uh, I noticed in his uh, video, uh, he talked about being strategic uh, in terms of our voting process. And let me say and go out on the limb by saying that uh, our strategy essentially begins in the sanctuary. Um, I could go back to the civil rights movement where the church was the cornerstone of uh, what uh, Dr. King and Malcolm X and Marcus Garvey and many others uh, bled, sweat, uh, cried, and through blood, sweat, and tears, uh, pressure, pains, and fears, um, they did what they could to try to bridge the gap that the enemy has tried to place in the life, especially in the African-American community, dating all the way back to the biblical days when 
uh, Pharaoh issued out an edict to kill all the black boys and Moses was ushered down the Nile River in an attempt to uh, liberate and free his own people. And then it goes on into the New Testament when Jesus comes onto the scene and King Herod issued out an edict to kill all the boys once again um, for the simple fact that um, what they try to do is annihilate an entire race, particularly um, the African-American community. And um, we've got to be intentional about, I think, doing what we admonish here at Fisher, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church here in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, when we talk about go fishing, you know, we, we go fishing. Um, and when I talk about going fishing, I'm not just talking about for food, but also for the faith and people of faith and for those who are willing to be formidable in facilitating this process. Uh, we can go and refer to um, the new international version um, uh, more when they talk about the gospel according to St. Luke chapter five, beginning with verse one, through emphasis through verse 11, where uh, when Jesus was looking for uh, a cabinet, should I say, um, he went fishing, you know, and he came across uh, a few of his disciples while doing so. Um, so that lets you know, unless we're willing to fish for folk and and, and cast our nets out into the deep well, with faith knowing that we can keep the faith and keep on fishing and keep up the fight. Uh, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And oftentimes, like Simon, we come up with excuses as to why we can't do what God has admonished us to do. And Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night, haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. In the past, we've worked tirelessly trying to ensure that we just have the right to vote. And now that we have that right, we must shift in terms of our paradigm in the present to um, attempting to bind the strong man and continue to cast our nets out. No, we don't know what we're gonna catch or how much we're gonna catch or who we're gonna catch. But the key is that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And if we have a hope to have this country um, turn in a way that is conducive to our circumstance, uh, we must mimic that of our master. Um, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. You hear that? So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them and they came and filled boats so full that they began to sink. Yeah, we can sink that battleship that is amongst us in the personage of uh, 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 biological warfare. Um, there are several types of warfare, but the one we're experiencing in terms of this coronavirus and COVID-19 is a biological warfare. You know, it's not naval. Um, we can actually see the bombs go off, but uh, this is uh, a fight that we have to be in to the finish because as you can see, um, the enemy is roaming the earth to and fro, seeking seeking whom he might be able to devour and destroy. Now, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am a simple man, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. See, we have to relinquish, you know, some of our, our, our faulty thinking and faults as it relates to our ability to matter during this Black Lives Matter movement and to make a difference as we attempt to send the souls to the poles. We have to know that with, all th with God, all things are possible if we only believe. Like the man said in the gospel, sir, sir, you know, I believe, but will you help my unbelief? And we have to be intentional about knowing that some things only come about through praying and fasting. So as a nation, we have to join hands together, uh, even if we can't do so in person, um, we can beseech unto his throne, knowing that God is not dead 
as Harriet Tubman told Frederick Douglass uh, uh, during uh, a meeting they had who were members at the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church along with Sojourner Truth and many others that uh, remain nameless. But we have to do our part and, and, and that's to cast your ballot while casting out your bait. Uh, uh, in Mark chapter six, verse 35, according to the New Living Translation, uh, there was an instance where uh, uh, people were hungry, almost over 5,000 folk. And we're not even gonna talk about the other 4,000 that Jesus fed. But it's indicative uh, in today's society that we're hungry, especially black folk. If you know anything about George Floyd, he was killed because he was essentially trying to feed his family. And since we're hungry, you know, they're not feeding us. So it's important that like Jesus told his disciples in the Mark chapter six, the gospel according to Mark chapter six, verse 35 said, you feed them. The disciples came said Jesus, but we have to work for years to, in order to get the wages and earn enough, which were 200 denarii in Greek and doing this project 100 in order to feed these 5,000 folk. And Jesus said, I, I didn't ask you, you know, what your circumstances were. I asked you where your belief was in me, Christ. And, 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 and if we can just believe and know that we can do more, be more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Um, then we can begin to make a difference as we flood the poles. Uh, with souls that uh, are, are intentional about seeing the change um, that is necessary in today's society. And as we project into the future, I would admonish you to do this and then I'm done. Uh, uh, there are several points to when you're fishing with faith. And while we're going fishing for voters and and those to flood the polls, like, like one of my members said, it's not just about the president and, and the vice president who's a thoroughbred, should I say, and, uh, and the person of Kamala Harris, um, but it's all the way down to the Senate and the legislature and the judicial board and on down into the common citizen. Um, we have to be uh, uh, tenacious almost because it seems as though someone is always trying to take our rights and our freedom. Um, I can attest to that as a young African-American male in today's society at the tender age of 16, when I um, accepted my call to preach uh, almost two decades, if not several decades ago, I realized that uh, 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 there was a, an edict that lived on from the biblical days on to today's society and will live on where they try to destroy what God has tried to build through the African-American society and community. Um, the word tells us to be fruitful and multiply, but they're trying to annihilate us by killing our black men and, and, and shuffling them and sifting them through uh, the penal system and, and, and catch charges that take your right to vote or even to bear arms or sometimes even to exercise your first amendment. And, 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 and it shouldn't be that way. So I here today wanna to stand in the gap for our children and our children's children who will come after us so that when their time comes and their rights will not just be restored, but be relevant and, and, and remain um, in a way that will allow them to do what God has called them to do. And God has called us for such a time as this. And um, I, uh, Reverend Dr. Staccato Keith and Powell II, I approve um, um, this message that um, um, members on this, particular webinar are attempting to convey. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Staccato K. Powell. So we do have a question because you gave us a lot of information and we appreciate it. Take it all the way back to the Bible because you know history is, you know, sometimes on repeat um, as, as we see, right? We have the Black Lives Matter movement, but our parents and our parents' parents, they were protesting and marching too. So we see that this is a revolving thing. I did have a question that was sent in uh, by a youth minister and he asked, you know, particularly as a minister, what is your job to support your community in politics? How do you support them? Great question. Uh, during the slavery days, shortly after the biblical ones, uh, there was something um, that was coined 
as being known as the invisible institution, meaning that there was a time where us black people were not allowed to worship in spirit and in truth and in our own special way. So uh, slaves at that time created the invisible institution in a way to worship, but to do so without the, their masters or, or their counterparts or our Caucasian counterparts, whoever, uh, for them not to know what they were doing because at that time, it was illegal. It was, it was, it was almost punishable by death, as Marcus would say. Uh, but now uh, it is important as a church for us to be visible. It's no longer we have to subscribe to that subscription as it relates to the invisible institution, but we can be visible in the community. Um, I talked about how hungry we were, we were. Well, as a church, you know, it is our job to feed the folk. We, we at Fisher, we have a food ministry, a food pantry where we feed on a daily basis. Um, people are looking to the church for answers. Church, like I said, during the civil rights movement, when Dr. King and the, the, uh, the, the conference um, that he led um, along with Ralph Abernathy, um, they um, essentially uh, were the cornerstone. The church was the cornerstone for the civil rights movement. And as we should be the cornerstone for the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, those of you who don't know, Dr. King was a Baptist preacher in his own right. Um, um, uh, Jesse Jackson, a frat brother of mine, uh, is a preacher in his own right and was very prevalent and um, very prominent during the civil rights movement. Well, we as youth ministers uh, have to take on that baton and not just take it on, but run with it. And, and when we run with it, run in a way that Jesus said, take up your cross and, and run swiftly to the master. Um, we must take our batons and, and continue to run the race knowing that it's not given to the swift nor to the strong, but those who are willing to hold on to see what the end is gonna be. That's the detriment for this particular generation, uh, this microwave generation, should I say. Uh, we believe things should happen overnight or just in the, uh, in, in the matter of a moment. But the truth of the matter is life doesn't work that way. Um, God is incrementalist and, and, and there's a process involved. And it's important that we get engaged and not just be on the sidelines spectating, but actually in the game, participating, running touchdowns with the ball that our predecessors have given us. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Staccato K. Powell. A lot of information, a lot of nuggets. Um, I think that perfectly goes into a small and brief video that we will be showing, uh, which features, of course, um, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as well. Um, after that, we will follow into some uh, voter preparation and some voter registration information for the states that can still register to vote. In this scene from the 2012 movie, Abraham Lincoln spells out the terms of Reconstruction. All they heard was the first time any president has ever made mention of Negro voting. In 1865, he said freed slaves who were intelligent or had served as soldiers should be allowed to vote. The 14th Amendment, passed in 1868, guaranteed this right as part of the full citizenship accorded to African-American men. But for much of the 20th century, voting remained a contentious issue. The 19th Amendment, ratified in 1920, gave women the right to vote, but the racial divide remained. Some states continue to limit voting, either through measures like the poll tax or direct intimidation of African-American voters. In the South, there were even whites-only primaries. This is Sam Tannenhaus of the New York Times. The first modern Civil Rights Act was signed by President Eisenhower in 1957. It created a federal commission authorized to enforce voting rights. Senator Strom Thurmond conducted the longest filibuster in history, more than 24 hours, in an effort to thwart the bill. 
but it passed. The location for the meeting was Senator Rivikoff. Still, voting was not equal for all. Massive resistance in the Deep South was organized to keep blacks from the polls, and legal enforcement was hampered by all white juries. Voting rights became a central issue in the civil rights movement. I think this march will go down as one of the greatest. In 1965, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. led the march from Selma to Montgomery for better voting laws. The nation was shocked by images of the marchers being attacked. And less than five months later, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It barred states and districts from curtailing the vote on the basis of race, color, or language. It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. Sections four and five of the bill included special provisions to ensure fair voting practices in a number of states, most of them in the South. Voting rights advocates say some citizens there continue to be disenfranchised. But the Supreme Court's close ruling on Tuesday, striking down Section 4, suggests that conditions have changed since 1965, and it is left to Congress to reconsider the act. So right there, we just had a small video um, that was actually recorded in um, 2013, but a small video showing you just some of the trials and tribulations we had to go through um, as an underrepresented community and really as an urban and as we can say black community just to vote. Um, I think it's very important that we know the struggle that, you know, the people before us went through, our ancestors went through to get there, right? Um, with that being said, it's more important than ever for us to get out there and go vote. There's a few states that are still registering voters, Arizona, the great state that I live in being one of those. We're going to have um, Deaconess Allen touch a little bit on voters prep and voters education. Um, and before we do so, I just want to tell you guys about our partner, Engage Arizona, that has um, so gracefully gave us their site to register last minute voters. Um, I will show everyone um, a quick preview on how you go to their website, how you register to vote, how you get it done. It is so easy. And I just want all my young people, everyone that's tuned in, if you have a friend, if you have a family member that is not registered to vote, to bring them to this site, tell them it's time for them to sit down right now and get it done. So right now I'm sharing Engage Arizona's homepage, um, which will be engageac.org. Right here, um, you're on their homepage and you can go ahead and register to vote at any time. So your register to vote is the first thing that pops up. You know, you get started. It will direct you to a page. How do you want to become a voter? Well, you want to register probably online right now at this point. Um, October 23rd is our last date and um, last day for us to register to vote here in Arizona, it shows you how you can register and what you need and you would click register to vote. You'll go there, it'll go ahead and direct you straight to Service Arizona. You can pick your language and you can register to vote. It only takes a few minutes. So if you have not registered to vote, if you're watching this right now, you know that a friend, a family member has not registered to vote, you bring them to this site and you register them to vote. If you guys are registering to vote right now on the spot, go ahead and put it in the comments. We wanna give you guys a shout out. It's a big step for some people. It may be their first time voting. For some people, they may have not voted in a long time, but go ahead and register to vote. And we wanna make sure we give you a shout out for just being part of the change and getting involved. Deaconess Allen, I'm gonna go ahead and let you take it away. Uh, Deaconess Allen is gonna tell us a bit about photo registration, photo preparation, and everything you need to do and need to know to get to the polls. Hi, everybody. So with uh, voter registration, um, the voter registration deadline for Arizona has been extended and um, you can register online. You can also register at a voting polling place. Um, they're open now and 
when you go there, your registration um, form is taken to the recorder's office or um, that day. So there should be no reason why you would not be registered before November 3rd. Um, so, you know, everybody has time to register. There's only 10 states where registration is closed. There are some states where registration is going on right up until election day. Um, tw I'm sorry, 20 states plus um, this, the um, District of Columbia. That's uh, 20, 21 states plus the District of Columbia. Registration is going on until November 3rd. So um, it's just so important to, to vote. It's like, just as I feel it's important, it's the least I can do to wear a mask when I'm out and about right now. It's the least everyone can do is to vote. And I thank you, Marcus Farrell, for introducing me to that term, downvoting. It's so important that we downvote because it affects how our utilities happen how corporates, corporations operate, the kind of health care we get. D down vote all the way up to the president is so important. And there are a lot of people that have miscon misconceptions about what happens when they vote or if they are even able to vote. A lot of people who are convicted of a felony think that they can't vote. Well, if you're convicted of one felony and you've done your time, and you've gone through their parole or probation or whatever you need to do, you're eligible to vote. If you've been convicted of more than one felony and you've waited two years, then you can apply to have those rights reinstated where you can vote. A lot of people who are disabled will feel, they feel like they can't vote. There are mechanisms in place if you're deaf, if you're blind, if you're disabled, they have a way to help you get your vote in. They even have curbside voting where two poll workers of two different parties for security will come to your car with a ballot to see that you get, that you get your ballot in. So there's absolutely no reason why we can't vote. And voting is like working together works. Rosa Parks, she spurred um, a bus boycott that shut down a whole city because we banded together. And we need to band together so we don't have four more years of what we've had. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Oh, Lord, <laughs> you have me ready. Thank you so much um, for going over that with us, Deaconess Allen. Um, she's a huge part of our political advocacy committee, which is Woman of Fowler. Um, we are very involved within the community, and we are part of the Women's Ministry of Fisher a and Zion Church. And I really thank her as our vice chair for really, you know, inspiring us and pushing us to the polls. Um, next, we have Pat Hunter, um, who is another representative for the, for the a and Zion Church, but it's also a writing candidate, a huge political advocate, and she's going to tell us a bit about prepping for the polls, what to expect at the polls, and what to do after you leave the polls. So uh, Pat Hunter, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Joy. Um, thank you all um, for the invitation this evening. It's so nice to be with you all. Um, I am the Assembly of Christian Education. I am the um, regional VP. And I am proud to say that Joy and Reverend Dr. Sakato K. Powell are doing their most with Project 100. And I take tip my hat to you. Thank you so much. So tonight, I, yes, I am a writing candidate here in the Bay Area in California. Um, please know that you can exercise your right to be a writing candidate. Um, we need more Black women to be encouraged and involved and be trained. So I want to speak to the hearts of young adults like Joy who is a strong woman, a leader, that you go out and learn as much as you can from your elders, your wisdom circle, and run for office. A writing candidate will name will not appear on the ballot. So you have to work a little bit harder, but we know about that. We're resilient as a black people. So um, it's not about uh, missing a date that you um, 
the date that you would register and file for um, office, you still go through the same process here in California. You have to get the 30, um, 20 uh, names of folks that, that, um, that would allow you to be able to vote. You still have to uh, have your papers go into the city clerk. So you do all of that. You receive endorsements, and I've received some great endorsements, the labor, the firefighters, um, Black women, um, Black women, BWAPA, Black women organized um, for political action. So let me calm down because I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm so excited. But to be a writing candidate, again, it's intentional, it's hard work. I have a wonderful team that serves with me, and we're looking forward to November 3rd winning. Also, tracking your vote. So we all know that what has happened, the roles have been called here in California. I serve and I, I am a member of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. And congratulations, Joy, my sister, who is also now there in Arizona. And we've been making phone calls, been doing phone banking, and people have been dropped off the rolls. So it's very important that you check your registration. California, um, you can register to vote. Um, register to vote up until November 3rd, it's called provisional voting. You can go to the polls, it's a different table you will go to and it's called provisional voting. So we are actually in early voting. Our early voting started on October 5th. So we are encouraging folks to know what to do. We know that there will be delays at the poll through Project 100. In California, we're a little bit more liberal, but what's going on in the Southern states, it just seems like uh, unbelievable to us here in California. So we received our vote by mail ballots a couple of weeks ago. You want to make sure that if you have not received your ballot, that you contact your city registrar's office or county registrar's office to get your ballot. And Deaconess Allen, you did an excellent job, an excellent job, and it's nice to see your face. You're a hard worker. Joy talks about you all the time. You did an excellent. And Mr. Farrell, thank you for the history. It is very important, we as a Black people, that we vote. And um, Reverend Dr. Um, Powell, you bring us from the biblical days until today. I take my hat off to you, sir. That was an excellent mini sermon for us tonight. It is so important that we as a people, we as Black women, that we get up and we vote. And we encourage our kids, our nieces, our nephews, our neighbors. And when we're encouraging them to vote, let's not forget that since 2020 was extended until October 31st as well. So here in California, um, we start going to the polls on October 31st, the early, uh, going, being able to go to the polls early, right before November 3rd. So I encourage everyone, the 17 year olds who have registered to vote when they become 18, it's up to us to train and speak to our youth and young adults about voting. Their vote counts, and it's definitely going to count during this race. So with that, I'm going to pass the virtual mic back to our moderator, Ms. Joy. And it's wonderful to be here. And I'm glad, I'm sure that our Bishop Crenshaw is smiling. Thank you for representing us with Project 100 from the West. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Pat Hunter. So once again, Pat Hunter is running in Phileo County as a write-in candidate. Um, I am so excited for her. That takes a lot of perseverance, a lot of hard work, but I know that even through all of this, the great thing about being part of a church family and community is that you get all the support and we are supporting her. Um, we're rooting for her. Um, she is a huge political advocate. And if I leave it up to her, she'll have me running for office, okay? So, um, you know, she's, uh, she's in a way a mentor to me and she pushes me as well, so we wanna thank her. So we had a few questions and we wanna hop in a few questions before we go into our next segment, okay? Um, we had a few questions about curbside voting. So I wanna leave it up to some of my panelists that are a little bit more well-versed and may know a little bit more about curbside voting to chat about this. Who knows about curbside voting? What is curbside voting? Are we doing curbside voting? And in what states are we? So I'm looking around, um, I see uh, my sorority sister, Kriana Dickinson, I see Pat Hunter. Um, Kriana, would you be able to answer a bit about curbside voting for us? Well, this is something that is new. And first of all, thank you all for having me. This is kind of a pandemic situation. So we have had an opportunity to really extend and open up our imagination around voting, which then goes to show you what we could have been doing if we had put the same thought process. We shouldn't have needed a pandemic to come up with more ways to vote. 
But now that we have this, let's take full advantage of every opportunity. Curbside voting is exactly that. The same way you pull up to the curb to get your takeout food during this um, pandemic season is the same thing you're doing with voting. You need to check with your specific state to see what the rules are, where the locations are. And again, to the voter suppression that is happening everywhere, the state of Texas has found it necessary to put one curbside voting location in each county, specifically in Harris County that has 4 million people, but they only have one place for curbside voting. In Arizona, we have drop boxes all over the state. You need to check with your specific county to find out where you can drop off your ballot. I did it today. I went to the, the local uh, ballot box here, walked right into the building, put it in there, walked right back out. It took less than a minute to do it. Save yourself the time. I know we like to go and stand in line. I know the significance of standing in line for us specifically. I understand that completely, but now is not the time. Go drop it off early because to Marcus's point, we need a shutout. And we don't have time for uh, to stand in lines if we don't have to, if your state gives you an option like the state of Arizona does to vote early. And keep in mind, there are a lot of states that have been doing mail-in voting and early voting for years. This isn't anything new to us, uh, specifically in Arizona, which also tells you that it was a project that wasn't made for us, but we're gonna take full advantage of it. So please make sure that you find out what's happening in your specific county, go straight there and drop off those ballots. Thank you so much, um, Fianna. Um, you, will get, you guys will have a more formal introduction as she will be sharing a topic as well to her, but thank you so much for sharing that curbside voting. Who knew we would come to a time as this? Um, once again, we're in unforeseen times and it takes literally for a virus to shut down an entire world before we wanna get innovative. I'm gonna be honest, I can't be fooled. If I can get all my groceries delivered, if I can get commercials just by speaking something and my phone pops it up right there, you're not gonna tell me that there's not a more innovative way for us to vote. So they have the technology, now they're forced to use it. And I'm happy that we are in a position where they're forced to use it because these are things that we should have had already. But now that we have it, look up and see if your state has curbside voting. Um, if you don't have the time, if not, drop off your ballot. Um, you know, the mail, there's a lot of funny things going on right now, guys. There's a lot of funny things. And I don't know if you're like me, but me, I just don't trust it. I wanna see them drop, <laughs> drop my ballot straight into to, to their slot because everybody has their boxes, they're ready to go and I wanna see it happen so that I know that I cast my vote. Um, once again, I wanna thank um, Pat Hunter for touching on tracking your vote. Um, I would like for her to go a little bit more in detail before we go into our next segment in how can you track your vote? One thing that I did not know about as you know, a young adult being part of that millennial age, right? Um, age group tracking our vote. So how do I know my vote counts? Well, I've never tracked my vote and I've been voting for years, being very active with my sorority, um, making sure that we're getting there. And that's since 19 years old. My first time voting, I was 19 years old. So um, I missed one, uh, I, you know, I, you know I, 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 I say I always missed some of the education that I could have gotten, but now that I have so many people around me that are educated, I just wanna make sure that we get that, that education and that knowledge to you. So um, Sister Pat Hunter, could you touch a bit on tracking your vote and how would you do that? Can you see my cell phone? I'm not sure if you all can see, but it is a link here in California that you can go to and it's track my vote and it tracks your ballot um, when it's mail received and counted. So what I've done is I've already done mine because I'm a writing candidate, so I want to know. And so they text me to make so they, I, that I knew that they had received and that I was logged in. So as you put your, uh, as they track it, they'll track it when it's received and then they'll send me a text message. And then when it's counted, a text message. And I also would like to um, share, you know, we've been hearing things about in the LA area that there are those boxes that are truly not the real boxes to drop your, your, um, your ballot in. So please, uh, as um, the lady before me was sharing, 
please make sure that you know what your what ballot box that you're dropping in check with your state and your city or county to make sure and we're encouraging here in Solano County that folks would just take it straight to the registrar's office we're not that far just take it straight your ballot straight to the registrar's office so what you want to do is just log in wait for that message to come back and again it's in every county here in California so I'm not sure if it's in Arizona and other country uh, counties nationwide but you know you just would go to your red to your google box and find out a great thing we have google so you google track your ballot and then list your state so i would go track your ballot um arizona once again for the people that just joined us before we go into our next segment i want to make sure that you guys are aware of um, how you can register to vote. Um, here in Arizona, we partner with Engage Arizona to register last minute voters. So I wanna make sure that all of the people that just joined, I see some awesome interaction going on on Facebook. Thank you guys that uh, guys that are um, joining us right now on Fisher Aiding Design Church's page. Once again, we wanna tell every person, your friend, your family members, your, 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 um, your associates, people from work, if you know that they have not registered to vote, and it's okay, let's make it a conversation. You know, let's make it a conversation. We have to make it a conversation. You tell someone, I tell someone, and we get it done. And I like that because it rhymes, right? You tell someone, I tell someone, and we get it done. So make sure that you are registered to vote and you can register someone to vote. So I just share my screen one more time if it, gives, if it gives me the option to do so, so that we can make sure that everyone is aware of how you register to vote. I hope everyone can share my, see my screen. Um, right now, this is finding your polling place. Engage Arizona is the committed and devoted to giving um, all Arizonians, everyone in the state of Arizona, a way to get voters education, a way for them to be connected to their leaders, and a way for them to register to vote. So make sure that if you're not registered to vote, you go to engagearizona.org, engageaz.org, you get started. It's the first thing that pops up get started, become a voter, register to vote, and you'll know where to go. There's a lot of about, about information. Um, you can go down there and you can see um, leadership, you can see news, you can see contact, but just make sure that you check out this page and anything that you may wanna know um, about voters registration or want to get educated on, Engage Arizona will have it on their website. Um, our next topic that we will be going into is we're going to talk a bit about leadership. So we've had a lot of information. We know that we have to register to vote. We know that we have to get involved. Um, but we want to see how can we get involved, right? It's easier said than done. A lot of people think it's a long, drawn-out process for you to get involved in politics. But we have a few uh, community leaders that currently lead and that have been leading for a very, very long time that are going to share their story, how they got involved in the politics how they found out would work for them. And before we do so, I just want to make sure that we share a few um, statistics, a few um, numbers that may bother some or may some people may want to know. So leadership for me, I like to look at numbers, right? Numbers is a big thing for me. And one thing that I became completely and utterly obsessed with was, you know, following numbers from the 1800s to all the way 2020 in Congress, okay? I found some uh, great statistics that I wanna share with you guys because this is really gonna show what the gap is that we need to close. And we're gonna show you guys this briefly so you guys know what we're looking at. So I have a, a brief report here from the Congressional Research Service. This was updated on September 22nd, 2020. So this is African-American members of the US Congress all the way from the 1870s to the the, the current year that we're in, okay? And I, the reason why it's so important that we look at certain numbers is because I think sometimes um, we sell ourselves short in where we wanna go and what we can do as people, right? Um, some people may ask, and we, we wanna make sure that this is, a, this is an inspiring call and that this educates people that may, that, that may be of, that not be of a darker you, that may be from um, a different ethnicity, a different background, that you guys are educated on what a struggle it has been. This is not to bash, but you know, people may ask, why is there not a list of 
Caucasian members in Congress, or why is this not? Well, it is because it has been a struggle. As you can see, it's been a struggle for us to vote. And these are numbers that we need to know as people so that we know what we can do to get into leadership, to get into positions that we need so that we can have representation. Um, I wanna go at a first slide right here, and I hope that everybody can see my screen. That's our flyer, apologize guys. I'm sorry guys, we're going through a bunch of different slides, but one is not showing. So give me one moment. So I hope you guys can see my screen right now. And I think I have some people on there. So this is figure number two. And we're gonna talk about the number of African-Americans in the House and Senate by state, district, and territory from 1870 to present. So um, they're not, huge, huge numbers, but they're huge numbers. And when we look at where we came from, right? Um, the only thing that I really want to touch on is the states where you see no numbers, okay? Um, of course, because the, because the African American population may be smaller in these states, but still we want to have representation, we want to have people that want to strive for something. So if you're watching this right now, if you are currently in politics, if you're looking to get into politics, and you have a big goal, you know, set your goal on something, right? Look at these states and see how many states need, rep uh, need, need, need representation. These numbers um, are supposed to be updated um, continuously. Look at where we're represented and where we're not. Um, I'm very proud of California because you see that we have a lot of house seats there that have been there since the 1870s. But, you know, we're looking at South Dakota, you know, we're looking at Kansas City, we're looking at so many different states that just don't have representation. If your state is up in the numbers, this is a great thing. But if you're not, then you know that there's work to do. And there's work to do all the way from the bottom to the top, not because you don't want to run for office, you may not want to be a congressman or congresswoman, doesn't mean that you can support someone in their run to get there, right? Um, I have one more chart of numbers that we can show. I'm not 100% not sure if they're gonna be shown, if we're gonna get to see them, they should be. In the meantime, I will go ahead and introduce our next subject. Our next subject is gonna be speaking exactly about what we're speaking about now, which is really, really our leadership. Um, I found a slide that we, that we need to take a look at. So let me share it with you guys so that you guys know exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about representation within our communities. Hopefully you guys can see my screen. This one is a little bit smaller. I don't know if I can uh, make it a little bit bigger, but there we go. So this figure one, and this is a number of African-Americans um, by Congress also since 1870, right? Um, the cool thing is that we definitely see uh, a big jump, you know, in house seats, which that's an amazing thing. But of course, Senate, there's less seats, which obviously is going to be 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 less of a jump. Kind of has stayed st stagnant over the years, and I believe that as young people, we should see opportunity. When we see numbers like these, we should see opportunity. We should see people that have fought for us, and we should see opportunity. So just reflect on these numbers. Think about what it is that you want to do. Think about how you can support, you know, your next leader. Um, to get there and how we can represent our communities. If we want change, if we want to see change, if we want to be part of the laws that get made in this land, then we have to get there. And you may not have aspirations to get there, but someone in your community does. And when they do, you have to support them. So next we're moving in to um, a brief um, open panel discussion. And we're gonna hear from some amazing leaders about how they got involved, how they got into politics, how they enjoyed their role and what they would advise you to do if you're looking to get into politics or just be influential within your community and helping that next leader get elected, get to the position that they wanna get so that you can see the change that you want to see. So um, we're moving on. I believe the first person that will be speaking right now will be um, Mayor Andrew Andre Rainey. Um, I would give him a formal introduction, but I think he can do his introduction himself and he would do a way better job. So uh, Mayor, please take it away. 
All right, thank you so much. So I do want to first say thank you to everyone. Um, uh, one of the greatest things about being in this position is being open to listen and learn. And you've all uh, mentioned a lot of things today that I, that I wasn't aware of and that I was aware of and happy to hear reiterated. So um, I thank you all for joining this panel and welcoming me, welcoming me to be a part of it. Um, my name is Andre Rainey. I am um, the youngest uh, African-American mayor in the city of Peekskill in Westchester, New York. And I'm the only, I'm only the second African-American mayor in the city of Peekskill. And um, um, going back to some of the things that you guys mentioned earlier, you know, um, outside of my office wall, I'm in my office right now, as a matter of fact, but outside of my office wall, all of the mayors of the city um, are on the wall. And uh, you'll never have a hard time finding me. <laughs> and I like to make sure that people are fully aware of that because I live my life to inspire. I think part of my purpose of, of, of my life is to try to find ways to inspire others to do um, what I do, but even better. And um, I tell people all the time, if there was a mayor that was like me when I was a child, I'd be running against 45 right now. And I really believe that in my heart because it's just the leadership of being involved, especially for our youth. So uh, one of the things I want to touch on is uh, something that um, uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Powell mentioned earlier about, about the history. I think one of, the, one of the biggest challenges, I think, of this generation especially is uh, getting your mind state and understanding the history that our people went through to get to where we are today. And, you know, we talk about, we talk about slavery, we talk about civil rights movements, like people in those, in, in those eras, they fought and they lost their lives for us to be where we are today. You know, there was a time when you couldn't play the sports that you love to play on a, on, a, on a professional team. There was a time when you couldn't walk in a certain restaurant if you were a certain color. And in, in the city of Peace in the 1960s, we had the Paul Robeson riots where uh, Paul Robeson was a famous um, actor and singer, and he came to the city of Peekskill, and he said that he wasn't going to perform in the theater if Black people couldn't um, attend his uh, performance. And so they cut, they, they shut the whole, the entire show down. And on his way out of the city, uh, his buses were hit with rocks and bricks and turned over and fired. And it was, it was a really, really true act of hate right here in my hometown city. And then, you know, less than 60 years later, you have an African mayor, African American mayor in that same city on the same grounds where that happened. So um, remembering where we came from is one of the key. I tell one of the keys that I tell people who follow me. Uh, whenever I walk into a panel discussion with young adults and college students and high school students and younger, I always ask them the first question is, how many of you want to be an elected official when you grow up? A mayor or a legislator or, or, or a county executive or a senator or a governor or president? And you'll get about two out of the 30 kids in there to say me. And I say, good. So you two, I don't really know about the job, but I'm with everybody else because I didn't want to do this either. It wasn't something that I grew up wanting to do. However, being involved in my community was something that I always did. I always raised funds for kids, for youth programs, for after school programs, educational programs, uh, school drives, book bag drives, school supplies, and things of that nature. And um, the thing that motivated me the most was a challenge. And I love to share this story because it's probably the best part of my career. Uh, when I first decided that I was gonna run for council, um, before I actually made the decision, I had asked people around my community what they thought about me running for council. I had been being asked for about six or seven years. And I said no every year. And then one year I decided, yes, I'd do it. When I said I would do it, my predecessor and a friend of his had came to the place where I was working at at the time. I was working at the youth center in my city. And um, they pretty much told me that they heard that I was planning on running for mayor. I mean, I'm for council. And they wanted to know if I would run on his ticket uh, with the Republicans. And I, I basically let them know that if I got in office, when I got in office, I'd be able to work with you if you want but I'm not running with you. I'm running with the Democrats in my city, the people who had asked me to run. And a lady that was with him said right then and there on the spot, well, you have to understand, uh, uh, Andre, this is bigger than you. If you run against him, then I have to ruin you. And I, 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 my response to her was, I wasn't even sure going to do it. And I'm definitely going against him. And um, I reached out to the people that reached out to me. And I said, listen, I want to run. I need you to teach me everything I need to know about running the campaign because this is all new to me. Um, being involved and being in elected positions is a little bit different. Um, and they said, sure. So two days later, we had a big announcement in the city. We had this big News 12 and everyone was there. And they, Andre Rainey is running for council. Yes, it's a new day at Peekskill. And uh, that same lady uh, posted on her social media page uh, a, a statement about me that I'll never forget. I have a screenshot of it in my phone, so I'll never forget it. But she said, um, this new guy named Andre Rainey is planning on running for council. He's probably going to claim to be the youth advocate of the community, but he can't be a youth advocate if he doesn't know his own father. And it was like, okay, <laughs> it took a little bit out of me. But uh, one thing I will say, and I'm glad that you have the people that you have on this panel is uh, the, the challenges that I went through through the campaign brought me closer to God than ever. 
And I think that that's a very important message that we leave out of uh, politics when we're running for office. And they say, you know, separates church and state. And I, I tell them, I don't know the, I don't know the state in this country without a church in it. That's impossible for me. So, you know, having God, putting God first was one of the, one of the best things that I could have done uh, in my entire life. And, you know, I have a, a huge background of being in, 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 in church. My family's background is in church. You know, we all, we, that, that's just in my family, but it took the best side of the devil, uh, which is running a campaign to pull me closer to where I needed to be to get through what I needed to get through. And the second message I tell people is when you run for office, you need to have a support system, whether it's your friends, your husband, your wife, your cousin, your sister, your uncle, your aunt. Uh, I've, I've always had a very strong support system of family and friends that have always been close. And whenever there was a challenge, um, I tell people, I read some things about me during the campaign that if I believed, I wouldn't have voted for me either. You know, but having that team by me, having that family, those friends, those people who believe in God as well, prayer warriors watching over me and looking out for me, that helped me get through what I, where, where, where I was going through as well. Um, but having that support system, that team. And the last thing I, I really wanna mention, cause I know that the concept today is, is mostly focusing on voting. When I ran my first campaign uh, uh, as mayor, I, I won by 164 votes. When I ran for re-election, I, I, won, I won by almost a thousand. And one of the things that I had to realize was I had to control my state of mind. I had to control my thoughts, my emotions versus everything I see on TV versus everything I see on social media, whether it's somebody who dislikes me or doesn't support me because I'm black or because I'm a Democrat or whatever the reason is, I had to be able to control my mind. And I think that that's the war that I'm trying to get our people, especially our black people to stand up and fight for. Like psychologically, we need to make sure that we don't allow the narrative that's out there to be true. And by saying that as a mayor, for example, we appoint me and the council, we appoint the city court judge, we appoint the city chief of police. Um, and in my city, you have a black, you have a black um, court judge right now an Hispanic assistant court judge. You have black principals at every school here in the city. You have a Hispanic uh, school superintendent, a black woman that's running the Peace Care Housing Authority, which is a, uh, the people that stand up and fight for public housing. You, um, you have a black deputy mayor, black business owners. Um, and I like to say you have a black female sergeant in our city, the first black female sergeant. You also have a black mayor. So the narrative of black people can't get this, black people can't get that. Um, it's not that it doesn't exist, but that has to change. The narrative can't be that if that's not the reality we live in though the consistent message of black people are behind, black people can get there. When you just showed that chart, the great thing about that chart to me was yes, we're not fully in the house, but we've escalated. You know, We've increased the amount of numbers. And that's what I want people to look at when we talk about the narrative of where we are as a black community, as an African-American community in our businesses and our elected official positions and our leadership. And I, I wanna end by closing by saying that many of the people who decide that they feel like they don't need to vote. Um, when I ran for re-election, I told everybody who I'm close with or my colleagues that I went to high school with, if you're not going to vote, the least you can do is get involved. Um, find somebody that you can that you'll support, or importantly, step up yourself. You know, the the one thing that I want to push as my agenda for our community is accountability. I want us to if we don't like everything that we see, if we don't like the way our pastor's preaching, if we don't like the way our teacher's teaching, if we don't like the way our mayor's governing, we don't have to necessarily just sit back and rely on a Facebook post or just point the fingers because Martin Luther King and them, as, 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 as the Reverend said, they fought for us to be able to say, you know what? I don't want to vote for that man who doesn't know what I've been through. I want to be in that position to, be, to understand what, what I've been through. And in the early 60s and the 50s and the 40s, when we were voting, it was a little different. You had to vote for people who probably didn't understand what you were going through, probably didn't understand your struggle, who probably didn't know what it was like to grow up as a black man or woman in the state, in the state of our, in the country of the USA. Now, you could put yourself in position to be that person that they're voting for. So if you feel like there's no need for you to vote, if you feel like your vote doesn't matter, if you feel like waiting in the line for two hours is too long, and, uh, uh, or, or sitting outside of, the, of, the, of the, the, the library to vote for three hours is too long, knowing that there are people who boycotted buses for up to two years, up to years of change, and you can't wait outside for two hours. I'll be quiet on that. If you feel like your vote doesn't matter, or if you feel like it's unimportant for you to vote because your vote doesn't count, or whatever your excuse or reason for not voting is, Think about the history of the people that lost their lives in order for you to vote, but they didn't lose their lives specifically for you to vote for people you don't trust. They lost their lives for you to vote or become those people that we vote for. And I'm a living testimony of a person who had no idea 
And I love to share this. I had no idea I would ever run for office. And in my first term, uh, we, we received uh, over $16 million in grants. And that's the highest amount of money our city has ever received under any administration in the history of our city. And that's just being in the right place at the right time and building the right relationships with the right people and understanding how to pretty much how to maneuver in the world of politics. And the hardest thing and the last thing I'll say is you cannot, you cannot get through campaigns. You cannot get through whatever negativity there is without one, having love in your heart, two, praying, and three, knowing who you are. And that, and that goes back to my point about being psychologically aware, knowing who you are. You know, once you get in office, you're going to hear things about you in some campaigns, at least. You'll hear things about you that's not true. You're going to read things that people said about you that you never said. And they're going to discourage us. They, 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 they divide us, uh, our, our Black people, more than anything, because it's so easy to divide the, the Black community in some situations. And I just want to leave with this little quick snippet. Um, there was a young man in my community who, uh, who lives in, in, in our public housing um, sector. And, uh, you know, he posts on Facebook every couple of days about how bad Al Sharpton is, how bad Barack Obama is, how bad, you know, uh, uh, Michael Jordan was. Like, everybody that he's talking bad about is Black. And, you know, one of the things that he mentioned to, to the people in his social media page was the Democrats in our city, they're trying to get rid of us and they're trying to push the Black people out. They don't want us to be able to afford, they don't want it to be affordable for us to live here and they want us out of here. Now, the two things about that that bothered me was one, it's false information, but he triggered a lot of emotions. And two is the people that actually are responsible for public housing, they meet once a month in his building. And the board that meets, they have two vacant seats <laughs> and it's been hard to fill that board. All he would have to do is literally walk outside of his apartment, press the elevator down to one and go to a meeting once a month and say, we don't want you to get rid of us. It, it, it's, it's really that simple. And that goes back to being accountable. It's easy to place blame on every elected official, everyone else, every activist, every black person that didn't do what you wanted them to do. But there's an opportunity for you to step up to the plate and you can be that person that you're saying is not doing what you want them to do. So I encourage everyone to, to, to listen to everybody on this panel. You all have given me a lot of great wisdom and I, I appreciate to, to hear everything that you've all mentioned. There's some history that I didn't know about that I'm excited to share with my friends. Like you know, I learned some stuff the other night on, on Project 100, but um, get out there and vote. And just remember, if, if you don't find somebody that you want to vote for, the least you can do, not only for yourself, but for the future and for your history, is to get involved. Thank you so much, Mayor Rainey. I mean, we see clapping in the back. You guys can't see it on Facebook, but he gave us so much knowledge. And I really hope that um, we have young men watching this, that you guys got inspired. The most important takeaway that I had was just mindset and you having that support system. One thing that I really think has killed our Black community is a mindset of you have to do it on your own. We are here together. And one thing that our ancestors did is they stuck together because you know what? We didn't have anyone. And, and, and when we look at times as these, right? We don't have anyone, right? Um, we see it, right? We see, we see it happen every day. We're not just talking about voting. We're not just talking about a Black Lives Matter movement or men being killed or police brutality. We're talking about sticking together because we can do some powerful, powerful things. Next, I wanna move it and bring it to my sorority sister, Kiana Dickinson. Um, she is a political director for the Arizona Democratic party she is going to give herself an, a more amazing introduction than i have done but she's going to give us a female perspective she's involved she's a huge political advocate she's very involved within the community and has done some great great things and for us women that want to get involved there are so many options and for sure for black women we heard this earlier on the call we were still suppressed our black men were able to vote at a time but we were still waiting so we came a long way and she's going to tell you how she gets involved and what she advises you to do if you want to get involved. Take it away, Kiana. Hi, hello everyone. And again, thank you so much for having me tonight. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, getting involved is just that simple to the mayor's point. Sometimes all we have to do is walk into a door. Sometimes all we have to do is show up to a meeting. Um, the most that you can do is either just join and sit in the background. When I first got involved, I literally went to a Black caucus meeting 
and stood in the background. And because I had a little bit of experience with Robert's Rules of Order due to being a member of my sorority, Sigma Gamma Rho, I was able to actually make some change in the room just simply because you had a little bit of awareness of how to call the question. You, you don't know how powerful calling the question can be in a meeting. It is literally that simple. So from anyone from being young to all the way up to higher leadership, join your student government if you are a young person. You don't have to feel intimidated. They might call on you, but just join, sit in the room. When you get into college, join an organization, student government, um, a sorority or a fraternity, just so that you can learn a basic parliamentary procedure and how to run a meeting. That will go a long way to understanding, I'm sure what the mayor deals with in every single council meeting is the same as some of our executive board meetings that happen there as well. Learn about government. And let me tell you the secret about government. It is not something to be fearful of. It is really just taking a look at your kitchen table. When you sit at your kitchen table, if yours looks anything like mine, you have a stack of mail somewhere. And you go through it every couple of weeks and you pull out your bills. So if you have an electric bill and you don't like how much that electric bill is, figure out who's governing it because your vote determined how much your bill was. If you have a water bill that is too high and you don't like that, figure out who governs water and figure out how you can get on that board so that you can determine how to lower those water bills. If you have a heating bill that costs too much, do that. If your trash collection costs too much, if there is a, a pothole on your street, figure out who you can vote for to fill the pothole on your street. If you don't like how much your groceries, the taxes cost on your groceries, figure out who is governing those taxes. I'm not asking you to go read law books. I'm asking you to look at your bills. Preach, sister, preach. <laughs> I mean, all the thing that I need you to do is look at that. And if you don't like those things, if those bills are too high, if your neighbors are being evicted because their housing is too expensive, if there's dogs running up and down your street and nobody is coming after them, if the trash is too loud when it comes at six o'clock in the morning, figure out who is in charge of that and figure out who to vote for to make that stop. And if you don't like that person, if you don't like what they're doing, if they don't respond to you because they work for you, then you need to challenge them on the ballot box, period. And that's how all great leadership happens from one very aggravated citizen who has had enough of going to someone who is not listening to them about something as what we would consider as common as trash pickup or a water bill. And those things right there can change something for your entire city. We spend a lot of time, and I spend a lot of time worrying about the top of the ticket and Biden and Harris, but I guarantee you, neither Biden nor Harris is gonna fix that pothole on the corner of your street. So we need to find the person that is going to do that, the person that's gonna invest in our children's education. There are always seats open on our school boards. Why can't we as any parent or even an auntie of a kid that's in there go and be on that school board? That will be the first step in creating the next set of elected officials is getting on the school board. I encourage people, specifically parents, to start their political careers on school boards. You see immense change and immediate change when you sit on a school board and you are impacting the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of students immediately. Not when a bill passed and then the next session, immediately. And that teaches you how to run for office. Sometimes on school boards, at least here in Arizona, we have so many spaces open that you can literally almost just sign your name and walk onto a school board which is sometimes how we get terrible people on school boards, but for the, for the good times, for the good ones, it is how we get great people on those school boards. And let me tell you a little bit how to get involved in campaigns. People think campaigns are complicated, that they are glamorous things 
As Marcus will tell you, they are not glamorous at all. But this is what we need you to do as a practitioner of campaigns. We need to teach people how to run for office, which means as a community, this is what you can do. If you know someone that is retired from business, is an entrepreneur, is a mother of three kids, somebody has organized, somebody that has put people together, someone that is a leader that can speak and with some passion, recruit them and support them to run for office. Now, how do you support them in their run? I'm gonna say the word that nobody likes to hear, money. You have to donate to campaigns and candidates. This is not a free endeavor. As much as we would like it to be, it is not so. The signs that we are all seeing, those things cost money and they're not cheap. The water that you have to buy from volunteers that help you is not cheap. The videos that you see, the pamphlets on your door, all of those things cost money and they are a necessity to making sure that your candidate wins. You also need to volunteer. And again, I say sometimes our time is more valuable than money because if I had 10 good volunteers, as opposed to one person with $20, I'll take the 10 good volunteers any day because they can hit an exponential amount of doors getting that information out and talking to voters. But this is what we do. And I'm gonna have just a little moment of honesty with my people because we're family right now. Is sometimes we give people our verbal support, but we don't give people our physical support. It is going to take more than just us saying, I support you, Sister Hunter, as a write-in candidate. It is going to take for somebody to get up on a Saturday morning at six o'clock in the morning with a stack of lit pieces and door hangers to actually go put them on the doors. That is what it's going to take. So we cannot just sit back and wait for other people to do this work. We're all going to have to get involved to do this work. Now, we like to do the fun stuff. We love to have events. We love to go to the parties. We love to be in the room and have access to and say that we know Mayor Rainey and I can call him anytime I want and pick up the phone and access is great. It is wonderful, but that will not help him win his next election. What will help him win his next election is a group of volunteers and dedicated people that are gonna put their time, talent, and treasure supporting him in everything he does. So I'm a very practical person. And I believe in giving people exactly what they need to know to do something. So when you get off this call, you know what you need to do tomorrow. What you need to do tomorrow is pick your favorite candidate. Whether that is Biden and Harris at the top, whether that is your local school board member, at the top of the bottom, because I like to say they're not the bottom, they're the top of the bottom. You find them and you ask them, what can I do for you? And in this time of COVID, it is probably going to be phone banking, or it is probably going to put, be putting lip pieces on people's houses, or it might just be using your own cell phone and calling 20 people and reminding them to vote. So tomorrow when you wake up after you feel thoroughly inspired by all of these amazing people on this call, tomorrow I'm going to ask you, I'm going to beg you for every candidate that is in your area that you get up and put your feet to the ground, you get your fingers off of Facebook and Twitter, and you get them to call and text as many people as possible to make sure that these people get to the polls, that these people are voting and that you're doing whatever last minute work needs to happen to support whatever candidate. This is going to take all of us. And I know we say the least that we can do is vote. I'm going to challenge that. The least we can do is vote, get our mom and them to vote, our cousins and them to vote, our sororities and fraternity brothers to vote, get our church people to vote. That's the least you can do right now. So I beg you for every candidate that is on every ballot in every state, move your feet. And that's how we are going to win this election in a landslide. Woo. 
Thank you so much. You know, I have to give it up for her. That's my soror. I have to. So, um, you know, she's a lovely woman of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, and we know about work. So just to kind of summarize what I've gotten, it is going to take work. I want to just piggyback off of um, Fiona Dickinson, her, you know, her comments, you know, in our community. Yeah, we love to support people. But um, when that financial support comes, we don't do it, right? And, and I know that. For me, it was a learning process. So me, I picked a candidate. And I remember I picked a candidate that was not even in, in, in my district, but I wanted to support them, right? And that was monetary. You know, it doesn't matter. It can be $25, $50, whatever it is. Same thing. We're talking about the things we have to do to support our candidates. Phone banking, doing all these different things, right? Um, I know that I found a reason to. Not only was I passionate, but I said, how about I do my workout and at 6 a.m. I meet you to drop off lit for you. That's fine because now I got my three miles in and I got to support a candidate. It's not glamorous. And I know not everybody ran track in college like me and just loves to get up and run and walk five miles, but it's it's a motivation. So if you can hit two birds in one, in, 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 in just in one, in one slide and one stone, and you can get it done, just do it. Do your workout. My young people get involved, right? We have no problem walking to different places. And I'm not going to tell people about where they want to walk to, but, you know, walk with purpose, find a purpose, find a candidate you're interested in supporting and you get involved. I do have a question for uh, Fiona Dickinson that had came in. Um, they asked me, how do you become a political director and how do you find out how you can locally get involved other than just picking a random board with maybe Tell them a bit about, you know, your background and how you um, got involved um, in your field. Well, I'll tell you something about politics is there's a lot of people that get political science degrees and a lot of them don't end up in politics. That is not, <laughs> that is not the way. Um, my degree was in communication and education and I was an adjunct professor of both of those things for many years. Politics found me and I have a, a passion for it simply because I am a mother of three and my determination is if I cannot protect my children past the age of 18, I'm going to make sure the people that are in office to protect my children are going to do exactly what I need them to do. So that's why I made sure that I was involved. But how um, you just kind of work yourself up through the ranks. So I started out doing a lot of little things. You know, I started in politics as a more seasoned individual. Let me tell you that I did come out of college doing this but i did all the things to learn you know you have to walk the walk you have to literally when i say that i mean literally walk you have to walk and knock on the doors you have to carry boxes you know uh, we have very fancy titles but everybody does everything we sweep floors we carry purses we write speeches we um you know drive candidates around this is again i tell you it's not glamorous work but it's work with a passion um you just have to do the work and you have to be very smart. You have to get in the room with very smart people. And I always tell people to listen more than you talk because you hear a lot more and you get a lot more education when you are willing to hear what people are truly saying and build relationships with people. Politics is about relationship. I know it seems like it's about everything else, but it's really about relationship. So be a trustworthy individual let people know that they can depend on you, show up when it's time to show up, show out when it's time to show out, and really put your best foot forward every opportunity that you get. Being a political director might not be what you want to do. You might want to be, your gifting might be in communication. It might be in speech writing. It might be digital, which right now is huge. And so anyone out there that's in digital, please look to politics because we need all the digital comms people that we can get. It might be in field organizing, which I think is one of the most important things um, in a campaign. Um, make sure that you understand politics is there's actual science to it. It is not just making stuff up. Right? We don't just sit in a room and pick places to go. Um, as Marcus can tell you, there is a science to how you do this, where you go, how much time and money and effort you spend in a certain place. And you must be able to learn the science. They won't necessarily teach you that in a political science degree. That literally takes sitting um, at the feet of someone that has done this before and letting them train you how to do it.
Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank her for being so passionate because not only do we need to see this, but me as a young woman, it just inspires me. And, you know, I am blessed to be surrounded by so many people that inspire me. Everyone on this call does. Um, I think a great thing that Shivini mentioned is that in politics, you can find out what your niche is. You can find out what it is that you do. So I can take myself for an example before we move on to our next speaker. Um, I always had a great way of relationship building. Don't know what it was, but I had a way. Um, some of these speakers I've known for almost 10 years and, and, and you know, just now we're, we're hopping on our first event or we're doing something. So if, we're, if it's relationship building, is it, if it's having um, a large influence, right? We have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have all these things, you know, and I will put myself out there, don't have a lot of followers, but I think with 10,000 people that follow you all over, you know, the US and in the world, you can have some influence, people that admire what it is you do. And it helped me get a great turnout. I see so many comments on Facebook right now. I see so many people supporting. So many people are excited about the information that they learned. And that is my way of contributing, being a political advocate and, you know, taking this wherever the Lord may take me, right? But that's how you start. And really, she mentioned something. You have to start from the ground up. I know we are part of this microwave generation. I'm a millennial too, so I won't talk about y'all, you guys watching, because I know some of my young ministers and young people are watching, but this is the only place where you have to earn your respect. So I've followed leaders. I follow leaders. Some of you guys know that's what I study, leadership you earn your respect. And how you earn that is by having integrity, being able to start from the ground up, right? Being able to get your hands dirty and get out there and get it done. Whether that's phone banking, whether that's walking all those miles in Arizona heat, I've done it, okay? Cause 6 a.m., I don't know if you guys know, Arizona is 120 degrees in the summer, okay? walking those miles and making sure literature gets dropped off, just being a person of your word and being able to build those meaningful connections that people feel that they can count on you. It doesn't matter what it is, they can count on you because when people can count on you, you can count on them. And I think I see that time and time again, the relationships that I'm building as a young, um, you know, multicultural African-American woman that I'm building connections and these last, last a lifetime a lifetime and the people that I've met been people of their word but people that are passionate about our community so what is better than being with like-minded individuals around you and helping push that change so what we're going to do next is we're going to move into um our last speaker for tonight I want to see if there's any um any panelists that had any common before we go into our last last speaker that will be sharing with us any yes ma'am Yes, ma'am. I, 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 I hear the word relationship uh, being repeated. And I think it's imperative that those who are under the sound of my voice know that uh, there is a specific relationships that reign supreme over all relationships. And that's first and foremost, your relationship with God. I don't know if you all had an opportunity to see the Democratic uh, National Convention, but if you notice uh, uh, our Democratic uh, candidate and the person of Joe Biden doted upon uh, his relationship with the deity of God. And if you ask me, I think that will ultimately get him elected, which is a, another great segue to this next and last statement. Um, not only is it relationship building and, 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 and fostering a healthy relationship with Christ, but you do so so that your mind and your mental state, where the battleground is, such as Brother Rainey stated, is regulated. Um, I, I didn't want to be one dimensional in my approach, but I preach about mental health year round, not just in the month of May uh, or, or, or September when we do suicide awareness. But uh, in case you didn't know, um, uh, one of the people who were responsible for the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, known better known as Abraham Lincoln, who was also a mulatto, dealt with mental illness in a real way, in fact, he had suicidal thoughts of his own and some seem to think his mental state, which could have been schizophrenia, induced his assassination. Uh, Martin Luther King, uh, other liberators like Malcolm X, Dr. King, uh, he experienced acute depression and, and anguish from a mental 
perspective so much so that Mahalia Jackson had to call him on the phone, those of you who've seen Selma, and literally soothed his woes uh, with the selection. And uh, uh, Malcolm X, who suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, he believed in feeding our communities such as the Black Panthers did in the 60s, but he believed in doing it by any means necessary, even if that means holding the AK-47 in his hand to protect him and his family. So uh, I, I want to uh, congratulate and, and, and co uh, compliment uh, those on this call uh, and say that, uh, and remind you that Jesus said to his disciples, come follow me and I make you fishers and not just men, but women of the same. Thank you, uh, women of valor and mayor and Marcus. Sister, uh, golden love. <laughs> that one was for you, Kriana. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Staccato K. Powell. I think that is the truth. You know, um, I've, I've seen a lot. And when watching the National Democratic Convention, I, I, I definitely did see um, the question that was asked. You know, I want to give a big shout out to the AME Church, where the AME were all part of the Black Methodist body, but, you know, particularly the AME Church that, you know, just really came um, to Biden's rescue when he was going through a very, very challenging time. And, you know, he mentioned that, gave them a huge shout out. So just the relationship with God is the most important relationship that um, I think it is to have. That doesn't mean it's the only one, but I think it's the most important one to keep yourself grounded. As uh, Mayor Rainey stated, there will be a lot of attacks coming from everywhere. And if you are mentally unprepared for a run such as this, and you know, I have not been in a run, but I'm speaking based off what I've heard a lot of my colleagues say, and I, I, I really am one of those people like Kriana Dickinson talked about, she knows me. I'll call her up, I'll be on the phone for two hours soaking up some knowledge. And everyone knows that. Every person on this phone has been on the phone with me and they know Joy loves to talk, but she loves to listen and learn. So one thing that I think is very, very important is that you are in a state of mind to where you can be there. If you wanna be for your people and for the people, you have to first be there for, me, for you. And once again, that goes into our segment of mental health. You can't pour from an empty cup. You're not going to make the just decisions, the just, or have just leadership as a leader if you are, what will we call it? A mess, right? You have to sure. feed yourself. So if you're feeding yourself spiritually, if you're feeding yourself in any way that is, um, that is where it starts so that you can be the best you, so you can be the best you for the people. I want to move on to our, uh, go ahead. Just, the way, just, just one more thing. I, I, we lack inspiration for lack of information. And we, it, we have to be intentional about getting rid of the stigma in society as it relates to mental illness. You know, our counterparts, you know, we used to think that was only for rich people to get therapy and, and to talk out their issues. But me as a pastor, I meet with my therapist pretty much on a weekly basis. So, you know, we should don't shun the fact that there are ways to promote mental health in today's society. Absolutely, for sure within our underrepresented communities. It is a thing called taboo. And while we're touching on issues that face our communities, I think this is a great way to talk about mental health and create awareness. A lot of our men are being incarcerated, are getting killed because there is sometimes PTSD, there's trauma, there is you know an underlying mental illness that is pushing them to certain things, right? And um, you know we're talking about, we want a prison reform, we want all these things, but I wanna see a reform. I want to make mental health a thing that we focus on. Um, we have been through a lot as you know co pe colored people and there's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of healing that needs to be done. Yes, we're doing great things. Yes, we're sticking together. Yes, we're getting ready to fold, we're fired up to have have everything moving in a direction that is prosperous for us but instead of looking outward I like what Mayor Rainey said what can we do so what we can do is be in the best state that we need to be in so that we can be leaders and we can be broken people trying to lead so let's start with us and in our community making mental health okay making working together okay letting you know letting younger leaders see that there's enough room at the table, we can help each other. But the only way to do that is if you are all the way right and you have that support system, as we mentioned. So we have our last speaker, uh, Mr. Marcus Farrell. Mr. Marcus Farrell has done some amazing and phenomenal stuff. I've been knowing him for almost 10 years. And um, the amount of work that he has done within so many communities, I mean, um, Jacksonville, um, we're going to talk about um, Atlanta, Georgia, you know, Arizona. 
Um, I just want him to touch on that. And I want a young leader to get inspired. There are so many different ways to become a political advocate or get involved without running for an office. So here we have our last speaker before we end the night, Mr. Marcus Farrell, take it away. Oh yeah, so my, my view changed because one of the first thing, because my camera went out. So one of the first things I say to anybody is always be prepared. Um, so check this out folks. First off, Reverend Dr. Powell, church, church as an AME brother, touch uh, 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 Mayor Rainey 20, for 2028 for president. Um, Pat Hunter, listen, you are taking on, you sister are taking on a, a, a tremendous task. Uh, so I hope that you are keeping in faith. Uh, I know it's not me for me to round it up, but I have to say these things. Uh, I want you to keep it in faith because as a, as a person who's a write-in candidate, that is literally the hardest possible thing you can do in politics. And so for you to even be on this thing right now, yeah. Uh, uh, Sister Deborah, I keep it up because without volunteers like you, we can't do anything. And if you want a really dope, really cool, on-point consultant, I don't know if she does private consulting anymore, but you need to holler at Kiana. Uh, she she consult she can consult if she can get away from the party a little bit and thank you for uh, getting back with me uh, uh, Joy it's been it's been a while since we uh, spoke did some work so I'm happy to be here first thing I want to bring up so now that I got it, I think I got everybody in I made sure I got my my for president for Rainey in right I, okay um, okay yeah that brother's that brother's dope fifteen million dollars in grants for a city that size come on man sixteen don't let me get it wrong so. Here's the thing that I want to bring up as I end this thing. First, I can't, I'm not going to say anything different from Kiana. Um, I started, I got into politics in a very easy, simple way. I was bored. My mama always told me this. If you ain't got a job, volunteer your way into a job, All right? Put in applications. But if you, if you got enough money to volunteer for something and prove that you were worth something, and that's exactly what I did. I, I volunteered my way onto uh, Alvin Brown's campaign uh, and, 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 2011. I, I managed campaigns before, but my major campaign was one where I just kind of walked on as a as a person off the bench. And I went from getting paid $8 an hour as a canvasser to proving my worth, showing up every day, doing extra shifts, knocking on doors, talking about policy uh, that the mayor was planning on bringing to the city of Jacksonville. And we knocked on every single black door in Jacksonville three times. That's a big city. It's a big town. And I was a part of that. And I actually ended up leading that. And then I ended up actually getting offered a higher position on that. And once we won the race, and everybody's not that lucky, but once we won the race, I became a, a, a statewide commodity because everybody was trying to figure out how a couple of black kids beat a white Republican in Jacksonville, right? So I'm blessed because we ran a great campaign, but also managed to learn strategy. Sometimes you walk into your opportunity, you know, there's luck is nothing but prepared is by opportunity with a blessing from God. Uh, there is there is nothing that I did that is special except have a work ethic that is uh, on a different scale, right? Um, and then continuing it, right? And in 2012, I learned the magic of have, of getting a mental therapist and getting therapy, and also talking to Pastor uh, Bishop Richardson once every two months to make sure that I'm, my head is clear and my heart is clear when it comes down to the work that I'm doing. Um, but it, this work is not hard if you care about your community. This work is not hard if you are actually having conversations with it or you see something that directly affects you yourself and you want to change it. So you can go and recruit somebody to run for office and don't let anyone tell you you can't run for any seat that you want. If you want to be president, try it. I don't necessarily suggest it, but that's on you and that's on your heart. Try it. If you want to run for state house, try it. We need, we need dog catchers. We need school board members. I ran for state representative because I frankly believe that the people who were representing me at that moment didn't care about the issues that I cared about. And I wanted to talk about those issues. I didn't win my race, but Lord knows I changed the dynamics of what people talk about in the state of Arizona right now. And that's, that's, so they, so people talk about things differently just because I ran. So I want to do something. I want to, I want to, I want to do an experiment real quick because I believe this is very important for people who are looking to get into politics. Um, and I want to talk to my pastors. I want to talk to my, I want to talk to my people of faith real quick. The first thing you need to do 
if you want to get in, uh, involved in politics, is vote. That's your fundamental entryway into politics, right? Um, and make a plan to vote this year. If you don't have a plan to vote, if you don't say already, and this I wanted to touch on this because we talked about it a little bit, Kiana talked about it, but if you don't have a plan to vote, if your plan to vote is tomorrow, I'm going to jump in my Volkswagen and I'm going to drive to the corner and I'm going to dump this thing off, then write it down and follow that plan. If your plan is to go election day, then do it. The people of the people of faith in any church who is involved need to make sure that their whole community has a plan to vote, point blank. There's no magic trick to it. There's a million different ways to vote, right? Uh, and, you, and you need to be informed of it. In, my, in Milwaukee, uh, the NBA, first off, shout out to the NBA, one of the greatest seasons ever. Uh, so much love to, to, the, to the black power movement that was, that was the NBA this year. Gave me all the feels, gave me all the love. And also they were talking about, if you noticed on the sidelines when they wore their shirts, it said vote, right? Every NBA voting center, every like there's 22 NBA arenas that currently you can currently vote in. And I'm going to tell you how much that these people don't want us to vote. These people don't want us to vote to the point where Milwaukee Bucks had a polling center in Milwaukee that was open at the stadium. And the Republican Party of that state decided that they were going to discontinue and not allow any votes from that center. Why? Because they didn't need a technicality that they decided to have that as a polling location a couple of weeks after that decision was supposed to be made. So they're trying to make it hard for us to vote in general. I want to say this because this is important to increase Black people voting from now on. The Black church has to get back to this. And that is knowing the community. Pastors, church members, don't step away from the community anymore. We have allowed elected officials to use us when they talk to us in October or September, but they're nowhere to be found in, Mar in March. They're nowhere to be found in January after the elections. And what happens too much within our churches is that some of our pastors, I'm not going to say all of us, because there's some very righteous people that are doing this work, but some of us allow these people to get in front of our flocks sell us a dream just because that person wants access to the elected official. It's on us to hold politicians accountable before the election, during the election, and after the election. And the best place to do it is actually it within the church. Why? Because there are problems right outside of our front doors all across the, all across the nation. And if we want to recenter the focus that was the powerhouse of the black church in the 90s, in the early 2000s, in the late 80s, when it came down to, came down to turning out voters. In this, in this season where disinformation is spread by Russian bots and operatives all over trying to subvert our black votes, trying to take our black votes away. We have to be more on point than any disinformation about voting, about issues of our community. And that starts within our own church community. So the only thing that I want to leave this with, because I, I feel like I had to say it, is we, as, as, as people of faith um, and as a sinner myself, we have to make sure that if we don't hold the people who come to our church, matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something. If you're a pastor and somebody comes to your church in September and says, I want to speak in front of your church, you say no. Why? You know why? Because... Your church was open from March to September. That guy was running from March to September. And he decides that he wants to get engaged with your church community. Some of the most poorest people, some of the most in need people, and you decide to create your talking points a week before the election. We don't do transactional politics like that, folks. We don't allow politicians to be transactional. We want real relationships within our community that's actually going to create change for our membership for our flocks and for our community if you know that your church is the only building left after it got gentrified after the neighborhood got gentrified then what is that pastor talk what is that elected official talking about to you right now i'm, I'm just trying to keep it real here folks because i believe that this is the way that we get the black church back to being it's always it's already an amazing place. <laughs> yeah it's already an amazing place so 
make sure your, your flock has a, a plan to vote, right? But the most important thing we can do is make sure that that person who is asking us for our vote actually has a plan to help out our communities so we can get back to believing politicians again. I'll leave it on that. Wow, wow, what a word. So guys, let's get off of mute and let's all just give this entire panel on ourselves a hand clap because that was- Amen, amen. It was great. So guys, we have finally got to the end of our discussion. I learned so much as you know, a young woman. I hope that you guys did too. I'm watching the comments going crazy on our church in, uh, Facebook page. So I know um, this one is for Kriana. Somebody said, I got a $200 water bill. Can they do something about that? <laughs> yes, they can. <laughs> so she did. I want to make sure that got um, answers for First Lady Tucker. She wants to know if they can do something. and Run for a office. <laughs> a, lot of us know, a lot of us did not know. And she brought it to you. And one thing about my source, they're going to keep it real. She done ran it down. All the time. If you guys know, now you know. If you didn't know, now you do know. Um, I just first off want to thank everyone. I want to thank Reverend Dr. Staccato K. Powell, um, my pastor, my church home that has put this on, that is constantly serving um, this entire state of Arizona, but it's nationally doing incentives. I want to thank my beautiful source, uh, my source, Fiona Dickinson, for just being on here, representing our sorority and representing just Black women um, in, you know, in, in, in politics and getting involved. I want to thank Mayor Rainey. Thank you so much. He's such a busy man. And he came because he wants to represent and talk to his people Thank in you. New York, to and all over the state. Um, he's doing amazing things. Like we said, he's in his sec. Oh, like he he got reelected, so that means you're doing your job because they bring you back, right? Because you know yes. you can you you, yes. you you can lie your way into into office and get there and sell a dream, like Marcus mm -hmm. told us about, right? That's but right. <laughs> sell <that> dream, <laughs> you won't be back. They got you out. They like, oh no, That's you lied. Right. You right. out of here. And that's how some of us are feeling right now, right? We want to thank Marcus for all the history that he has given us. Yes. I've been knowing Marcus for almost 10 years. And I know that when I met him the first day, he was campaigning, trying to pull me into that campaign. He said, this is what we're doing. And guess what? He did a, he did a phenomenal job in Jacksonville, well, in Florida, in Georgia, and in Arizona, uh, where, you know, where he's doing amazing things. Um, I want to thank um, Deaconess Allen for being here. She is such a huge political advo uh, advocate for our Women of Valor uh, Political Advocacy Committee. She's an amazing vice chair, brings so much knowledge and, you know, keeps me in check as a young woman. Um, I want to thank um, Sister Pat Hunter. She's doing amazing things, not only within the AME Zion Church locally. She's a writing candidate for Vallejo, in Vallejo County. This takes grit. And I want you guys to put your money where your mouth is, like Brianna Dickinson said. Now, you guys see she's a writing candidate. I know some of you guys that are watching are right there in her county with her. I know we've seen all the messages. We support him. How are we going to stand behind our sister in Christ? Are we going to, we're going to, we're going to dig deep because we want this change. So we're going to dig deep. We're going sister, to support sister, sister Waitman, we got to give her a chance to give us our website. We got to get her, we got to yes, find out how to yes. donate. Let's yeah. do this, Pat. What's your website? So my website is www, of course, writeinpathunter.com. Yes. How easy is that? Writeinpathunter.com. Yes, we will be Thank sharing you. it on the uh, Fisher A. Design um, Church Facebook page um, so you can find more information about Pat. I want to leave the floor open. There was a lot of questions that we could not answer, but I will make a commitment to connect you to these leaders if you have more questions for them. So that's my commitment. Didn't even ask them about it. They may not want anything to do with you guys after this, after the Zoom, but uh, I made that commitment. They'll get in contact. They are revolutionary leaders and they're gonna do whatever they can to push it forward. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. I wanna close it off. You guys know I'm a woman of God and I gotta give all the glory to God for making sure that we can do this. So I'm gonna close it out with a small prayer, making sure that we are good and we are ready for battle. Um, politics doesn't stop November 3rd, guys. I know this is amazing, we're right here, but let me tell you something. For our young people, that's when it starts because you need to get ready for the next four years. So now you know what's coming up, but what can you do locally? 
what where can you be in four years what can you do in four years so i want to close this up with prayer let's all bow our heads before we go this night we had so much information and i'm just thankful and blessed and i got to give it back to the person that made all this possible all these amazing connections and then all these revolutionary leaders on this call um so i'll bow our head <sighs> Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for what you've done today. Thank you for bringing all of these leaders together to do amazing things within your community, to educate people, to inspire people. We know that this, this race is, is not an easy thing. It's not for the people that want to get in and get out, but we know that these people have stuck so much time and effort into their local communities to push it forward. So you strengthen them along the way. You make sure that all of their needs are met. You make sure that they get all the support that they need make sure that they get the support system that they need and when they don't get the support father god you make sure that you are their support system because you keep us in perfect peace i want to thank every single person for being here hoping you bless them hoping you bless all the viewers all the people that listen in hopefully young young women young men within our communities got inspired watching these leaders and are going to do amazing things for the upbuilding of the kingdom are going to look after their community and make change all for your glory in jesus name we pray amen thank you guys so much for being here i appreciate it everybody have a great 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 night and any other questions will be answered on the fisher amy zion oh, church page I'm so sorry. Do you have anything else, Sister Pat? Are you all good to go? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, my my uh, check boxes popped open. So I'd like to say thank you in person to everyone who donates in advance. So thank you. And I see Mr. Marcus kept his work. So right on. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you guys so much. This was phenomenal. Everybody enjoy your night. Mm -hmm. And the replay will be visible on the Fisher Amy Zion Church page. Once again, that's Fisher Amy Zion Church on Facebook. And we look forward to connecting with you guys all this next event. Last words, go vote. <laughs> Good night, everyone.